All right, so we're in our work session, and the first topic is legislative consultant introduction and discussion of our 2018 priorities. Hi, Simon. Hello, good evening. I will try and be brief. I know you got a few things on your plate this evening. Uh, tonight, we're happy to be able to introduce our uh, legislative consultants for the 2018 uh, State of Iowa legislative session. As a reminder, uh, council approved the contract uh, for uh, our uh, consultant services at the November 21st meeting of this year. Uh, Carney and Appleby were selected after an RFP process. Uh, a little bit about the background of our experience engaging with lobbyists um, from 2012 to 2016. Uh, we use the firm, uh, the Davis Brown Law Firm in Des Moines as our legislative consultant. Uh, the primary contacts with that firm that we had left the firm in 2016. Uh, we decided in 2017 to go without uh, any uh, contracted services uh, for this as we evaluated our needs going forward. Uh, the 2017 session was um, eventful and uh, we clearly saw the uh, value in engaging with a lobbyist uh, moving forward. So uh, Carney and Appleby uh, currently represent the cities of Des Moines and Waukee and are familiar with city issues. Uh, they, um, in their RFP response, uh, the, very clearly understood uh, many of the issues we expect to deal with over the next year. Uh, they have over 80 years legislative experience combined and good relationships with legislators from both sides of the aisles. And the firm will also provide services after the session uh, with the rules making process. Uh, right now, the Alcohol and Beverages Division is going through a licensing reform a conversation that we will uh, expect to lean on their expertise during that process as well. Uh, so in a moment, I will ask uh, Jim Carney, Doug Strike, and Jenny Dorman of uh, Carney and Appleby to introduce themselves and uh, begin this discussion of your 2018 legislative priorities. Uh, typically, council considers a resolution uh, formally adopting their legislative priorities uh, prior to the beginning of the session. Uh, and so staff is requesting that um, you direct us tonight to, to prepare such a a resolution and any direction of what you want to see in that resolution and we'll have that ready for your January 2nd meeting. Um, top priorities from the Metro Coalition and League of Cities were also included in your information packet. Um, generally, uh, we uh, tend to be on the same page with uh, many of the issues uh, called out there. Uh, their top priorities of uh, protecting backfill payments uh, for commercial and industrial um, replacement, um, protecting local control on a number of issues we would expect would be included in these priorities priorities. So uh, without further ado, I will uh, introduce the representatives from uh, Carney and Appleby and both staff and our consultants will be uh, around to answer questions uh, for developing your priorities. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, please. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we're excited about the opportunity to, to represent the, the city of Iowa City. Um, I've had a long-term relationship with the city going back to 1966. Uh, when I went to school here. Um, since then, I've, I've served, uh, I am serving on four different boards that, uh, with the university that gets me down here pretty regularly, in addition to the sporting events that I come to. So I, I'm just in and out of the city all, of the, all the time, and I just, uh, I love Iowa City. So we, we're excited about the opportunity to, to, to represent you. My partner, Doug uh, Strike, uh, his daughter's going to school down here, so it's another opportunity to come and visit and, and uh, use that as a way to, to meet with you uh, probably more often than, than what uh, someone else might uh, other, otherwise do. Um, I've been practicing law in Des Moines since 1975. Um, this will be my 43rd year of working at the uh, Capitol and doing legislative work. Um, it's uh, been a, a terrific experience. That's a large part of our practice. Uh, we practice law in addition to doing legislative work. Uh, Doug is almost full-time uh, uh, legislative, although does some legal work. Jenny uh, just uh, joined us uh, literally last week and is uh, going to, but she's familiar with the legislative process. She's worked up there for two years on, on staff positions, so she knows how um, a bill passes and how legislation works. Um, we have an eight-person uh, firm. Um, 
And uh, with uh, George Appleby retiring, uh, the, up, up, up until when George uh, is retired at the end of this year, we had four people doing legislative work. So you get an idea of the, the amount of time and the resources we throw at it. Uh, we're up there every day, uh, all day. Um, and um, spend a, a tremendous amount of time at the Capitol. Uh, I think in terms of looking toward this session, uh, just a real quick overview for you. Uh, it might be a good year to have a new client in the sense that it should be a short session. Um, short for a couple of reasons. I don't know how familiar you are with the way it operates, but the first session of the biennium, they get 110 days of per diem. Second session of the biennium, they reduce that down to 100 days. Generally, they're pretty, uh, they get out of town fairly quickly after the per diem uh, stops ordinarily. Um, this year, they're talking about, there's what we call a funnel. And that's uh, when a bill has to reach a certain stage of the session, uh, get out of committee or it's considered dead. They're talking about shortening the funnel, uh, taking it down maybe to 90 days. Uh, so that would be a, a real, real short session. So the, the rules themselves kind of dictate the, the length of the session on the per diem and shortening that. Uh, I'm going to let Doug uh, briefly address the uh, budget issue that the state's facing. It's horrendous. Um, Doug knows the budget about as well as anyone. I view the budget this way. It's, it's, if you think it's bad, it's not bad. It's really bad. If you think it's really bad, it's really, really bad. Uh, that's how I think of the budget. And, and it, that will cause them to probably um, uh, shorten their work up. They'll start with a $40 million deappropriation again. They deappropriate first bill last year, one of the first bills was the deappropriation bill. It'll happen again this year. Uh, the, probably the third thing is that it's an election year, so they're going to want to get back home and start their campaigns. And the fourth thing is that um, uh, from the Republican side of the aisle anyway, they did a lot of major bills last year and a lot of the major, major things that, that were priorities of the Republicans were done last year or so. It ought to be a fairly short session. Other issues that I think, uh, I know a couple of them might uh, be of interest or will be of interest to, to Iowa City. Uh, opioids will be on, uh, on the table and for discussion. Mental health will be on the table. and. Uh, be a lot of discussion involving mental health, uh, tax reform, could be a death penalty bill, and then uh, privacy and identity theft. Those are the kind of the big ones that we see out there other than specific issues that relate to, to the city. We know you're interested in the backfill. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion um, with legislators uh, prior to today, uh, met with all the uh, local folks in Des Moines, met with the appropriations chair leadership. Uh, that's up for grabs, uh, what might happen. Uh, we hear uh, things from, uh, you know, there's uh, might be a phase in or a phase out of the backfill. Um, I don't know if it's going to be possible uh, financially, fiscally, to to do the, you know, maintain the backfill like it was uh, intended to be maintained. Uh, so that's going to be out there. We know that that's a 1.5 million dollar hit to Iowa City, and that's uh, significant. So that will be a, a major item. We know the sanctuary cities are a major issue for you. Uh, we've been working on that uh, also already. We've worked that issue before. Uh, we represent the Iowa State Bar Association and that uh, we registered against the bill last year on behalf of the Iowa Bar Association. Um, there are a lot of good, good legal arguments to be developed on sanctuary cities. Um, there was a very recent uh, article in the Des Moines Register. I don't know if you, anyone reads the Des Moines Register down here, right? Where was, <coughs> you know, was that right, Adam? That's, hmm. that's, uh, so, uh, but there was an article uh, about that, uh, so that could be up on the House side. The bill passed the Senate, over in the House. Um, pensions, we, we've talked to um, uh, Jeff and Andrew and Ashley about the pensions. Uh, rental permits uh, are items, too, that we've discussed with them. 
So uh, we're here to learn uh, about your priorities and get to know you a little bit uh, better um, and for you to have the opportunity to, to get to know us. We intend to be down here as often as needed. Uh, it's going to be, I think, uh, easy for us to get down here. Um, uh, anytime you, you need a meeting, we'll be here. We're, we're uh, committed to having a lot of communication with, with Andrew and Jeff and Ashley. Uh, Eleanor, too, I don't want to cut you out. I know you've been Im Im involved in a lot of this. So um, those are our plans. And again, we, we think it's just a, a heck of an opportunity uh, to be representing you. With that, I'll uh, turn it over to, to Doug. Um, I, do, I do know this. Uh, you're fortunate. Your, your legislative um, re representatives here do a great job down in Des Moines. Uh, Bob Dvorsky, who has Coravel, is on local government on the city side, on the Senate side, excuse me. Uh, Bobby Kaufman, Kaufman, Vicki Linsing, and Amy Nielsen are all three on the local government on the House side. So you have good representation on local government, um, and they'll be, uh, they'll be very helpful to us. We've got a great relationship, I think, with all of them. Um, my uh, approach to um, to lobbying uh, has been to be uh, just totally, if you will, nonpartisan. I like to think that um, I personally have uh, uh, ability to talk Republicans and Democrats and uh, House and Senate. It doesn't matter who is in power. And the same thing with the governor's office. We've had great relationships uh, over the years with with uh, with the governors. Uh, going back, Terry Branstead was a classmate of mine, and so I knew Terry forever. Didn't always agree with him on hmm. politics, but, uh, but knew him quite well. Um, Doug, you want to introduce yourself and chat with the council a little bit? Thank you, Mr. Jim, and uh, members of the council, thank you for the opportunity. Again, we're very excited about this. Um, opportunity to represent you. Jim laid out a very high level look at the budget and, and he's right. You know, think, think of a bad budget and, and uh, while we have seen worse uh, in 2010 when we were looking at a state legislature that had to do a 10% across the board cut, we're still growing in revenues. However, the revenues are not growing at a level uh, that sustain the spending, can sustain the spending commitments that the legislature has made. Um, we've also had five now consecutive RECs, revenue estimating conferences, that have come back and actually missed their estimates on the high side. And the legislature for three legislative sessions was able to adjust that using uh, dollars that they had in their ending balance when the when these adjustments fell upon them uh, the last two years now, uh, assuming what they're going to have to do when they come back in, they've actually needed to look at the appropriations. The FY17 legislative uh, budget uh, actually had to be reduced a total of about $250 million uh, over the course of three different, two different revenue estimating conferences and then finally a closing of the books. We're not that bad right now. Uh, the October Revenue Estimating Conference looking at FY18, which is the current fiscal year we're in, uh, came in and said that uh, it's probably going to take a $34.6 million deappropriation, and that number was confirmed. It was not increased by the December Revenue Estimating Conference. Um, just for a, a piece of information, the legislature must base their budget and the governor must base their budget, his her budget, on the December Revenue Estimating Conference number. Uh, they will get another meeting of the Revenue Estimating estimating conference in March, and if the March REC number is lower than the December, then the legislature needs to adjust their budget down. If there's a greater amount of money that's available through the March REC that doesn't become available under state law, it actually is, is technically, uh, according to Iowa Code, supposed to flow into the ending ballots. So right now, FY18 is looking at getting a $35 million haircut. The predictions for FY19, they actually reduced it between October and December by one-tenth of one percent, about $7 million. Uh, the problem with the uh, even having 4 percent growth, by the time you pay back the economic emergency fund and the ending balance, 
or I'm sorry, cash reserve funds that were used to prop up FY17 and what's going to be needed for FY18. You take a significant amount of money, roughly $91 million, out of the new available revenue when you pay for growth and footprint in uh, Medicaid, which is, is not talking about managed care here, not, not talking about money to MCOs, talking about just growth in eligible individuals in the Medicaid budget. That's another 91 or 94 million dollars. Assume since it's an election year, you're going to throw a little bit more money into supplemental state aid, the old allowable growth for K-12 education. By the time you do that, you're looking at about six million dollars new money year on year if you hold every other aspect of state government flat. That's not a whole lot, not a whole lot of money to, uh, to spread around to the remainder, remainder of state agencies. And if we get another hiccup in March with a lower REC, it's going to get worse. In particular, why is this relevant to you? The backfill. If the legislature is looking for additional funds to try and, and increase funding for regents or additional funding for K-12 or, or corrections, wherever they choose to put that money, one of the places that they've indicated they'd be interested in looking at is the backfill. If, if they reach into that, uh, it, it could prop up their budget. We also think it's going to be uh, more difficult than they uh, anticipate because it's going to result in a tax increase generally at every community level when when the committee or the, when the communities have to adjust their budgets and adjust their millage rates to address the offset your 1.5 million dollars the city of Waukee's about a quarter of a million dollars Des Moines 5.2 million just keep rolling that across the state if the cities want that money they're going to have to increase millage rates in, in order to offset what the state had promised that reality is going to strike home and hopefully we can utilize that to our advantage to make sure that we either fund the backfill or we're able to uh, to phase it out so that cities and our clients have the ability to uh, to withstand that in a way that doesn't result in an increase in the millage rates. I'm sure that's more detail than you wanted on the budget, but it is very relevant in particular to dealing with the backfill. We don't know what the federal tax uh, tax reform implications are going to be to the state. Um, very, very high level. We have federal deductibility. When you de so with federal deductibility, when you decrease what individuals are paying in federal income tax, that increases state revenues because you're losing some of that deduction that, that individuals would claim on their state taxes. No one has been able to quantify that yet. It's, it's still too new. Now, there are legislators who are talking about also getting rid of federal deductibility and using some of the money that would come in for that to address tax reform. We're not sure how all those pieces fit together, but we're <coughs> certain that backfill will be part of the discussion. So we need to continue delivering the message that this will impact cities and therefore it will impact taxpayers. With that, again, thank you for the opportunity and Jim, Jenny, and I stand ready to address any questions that you have. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thanks to Jim. Thanks to um, Doug, right? Uh, uh, yes. Thanks for doing that. Very informative. Uh, I speak for myself. Uh, I, I felt like I got some insight into what's going on from very knowledgeable people, and that's a real treat to see. Do any of you have questions for our visitors? Yes. Um, so this kind of maybe is a conjunction question. So what's the expectation of follow up? And so you talked about in March there could be some changes that we may or may want to be aware of. Is this something that you're going to communicate to the city manager and city attorney's office? Or do we need to make time now for you to come back before us to have that conversation? I think what they were referring to is the Revenue Estimating Commission is, is going to reconvene in March, and then depending on what their findings are uh, and looking at the state forecasts, uh, the legislature in, in Des Moines is going to have to make some adjustments potentially. Those adjustments may or may not impact cities. Um, you know, in the past, um, as we've worked with um, uh, lobbyists, it's really been uh, the city manager's office and occasionally the city attorney's office. We're on weekly calls. We're really sometimes on a daily basis communicating with them. Um, and then uh, at times we've pulled council members in either to come with us to Des Moines to lobby on a particular issue or to attend a hearing or anything like that. Uh, after the end of last year's session, the council indicated a desire uh, to, to be more involved um, on legislative matters. We didn't really define that. So we wanted to start that discussion tonight. That's why uh, the team is here to, uh, to start the introductions. And 
staff would need some direction from you on how you want to, uh, you know, how you want to be involved, uh, and what types of updates that you would want um, from us. Typically, our office would would update the mayor on a regular basis, and the mayor would use his judgment to, uh, you know, to determine if we needed to update the entire council on a particular topic. The. The key, I think, is this, is the legislative session starts, they had a, what they call a revenue, revenue estimating conference, give them numbers that they can kind of do their planning and, and budgeting for the year, hopefully. But they're required then in March, after the, they do their uh, estimating again, at the March time, they, they kind of readjust. And if there's been less revenue, they got to dial back you know, they, they're going to have to readjust, and then that would be a really key moment to know where you may be. Now, hopefully we'll be kind of getting a read on that as the session goes along, and we'll be in, in close contact with with everyone and, and let you know how we're, we're seeing that. To, to that was a good question. As a means of example, we can use what happened this previous session through 2017 legislative session. They came in, and the December REC had said do a $118 million deappropriation, so a lot larger than what we're dealing with this year, you know, roughly 25%, uh, but it's a $118 million deappropriation. When they came back, the Revenue Estimating Conference came back in March, they said, okay, we need you to cut the budget by another $132 million. If we had that happen, where we went from 34 and then they came back in and said, well, you need another $100 million to balance the budget or to, to set up for the, the incoming year, that really increases the pressure on the backfill. That, that, would, be a, that would be a oh my moment. We really, really need to step up efforts to, to stave off that cut. And I think the real challenge that you have because of the way cities budget, um, we've been told that you'd like to know the numbers earlier than later because you then have to redo. I mean, it puts you in a real pickle, okay? But I, I just don't know if we're going to know early enough. You know, you're going to have to do your budgeting and see how, how it works out. And we're, we're cognizant of your need to know sooner than later. Jenny didn't get a chance to introduce herself, but uh, Jenny, you want to say a few words? Hi. Um, obviously, they said I just started last week, uh, so this is all pretty new to me. Um, but I'm Jenny Dorman. I just graduated from Drake Law in May, passed the bar uh, in September, and started last week. I went through their legislative practice program, so I've actually worked in both the House and Senate, so I know how it works on the inside, which is going to really be helpful for me this year working on the outside. But that's pretty much all I have right now, so if you have any Nice to see you, Jenny, and uh, welcome aboard. So, Jim, Doug, Jenny, uh, I, I have a question that is um, um, maybe a little bit difficult to articulate, but my general impression is that for many Iowa legislators, especially on the Republican side of the aisle, Iowa City does not have a very good reputation. Now, it, you would know better than I whether that's true or not. But if it is true, I would hope you would help us convey to the legislators that we have a very well-run government down here. And we, our financial management is uh, really very competently done and uh, would make any city proud, uh, AAA bond rating, for example. Uh, and other things that we do in Iowa City are uh, exercises in democracy, where we're living out uh, what the people of the city believe in. And, and it would seem to me that we would want to be able to work with the legislature in order, in a way that would enable them to do what they think they need to do, but re ensure that we retain uh, our prerogative, well, not prerogatives, but uh, um, uh, right to govern ourselves as we uh, see fit, it's, you know, subject to constitutional constraints and that kind of thing. I, I think you probably understand what I'm, I'm getting at, but uh, I hope you would be able to help us on that. 
that's a subject that we uh, openly discussed <laughs> in detail with uh, Jeff and Andrew and uh, Ashley, and uh, you know we uh, we heard we heard that message, and so uh, you know we talked about it, and I, th I think that can be addressed in a very positive manner with the legislature. Um, uh, Doug and I went around and uh, talking to leadership after we learned that we were going to be representing you and uh, sat down like with Speaker uh, uh, Linda Upmeyer, okay? Uh, the conversation went uh, something like this. Linda, we're going to be representing uh, Iowa City. We're, we're, we're happy to be representing Iowa City. And uh, if you got a bone to pick with Iowa City, we need to know about it. If there's a problem with Iowa City, we need to know about it. We want the opportunity to address that in a real, real positive upfront way. And we're going to be working with uh, both of the caucuses on both sides to try to find out if someone does have a problem with Iowa City, what it is, and, and, and address that. And I think we can be really, really good ambassadors for you down there uh, because um, we believe in what you just said. That would be very helpful. Thanks. It's communication and, mm -hmm. and relationships. Uh, communications, relationships, and education. Uh, Jim and I were together on Saturday shortly after the, uh, the article about sanctuary cities came up. And uh, we, were, we were sitting and brainstorming a little bit, thought, well, let's reach out to a couple legislators. We reached out to them uh, while we were together, uh, threw out some ideas, said, you know, can we sit down and just talk about this? Let's actually read through the law, your proposed law, and what does it really mean and how does that work with, with what some of our clients are doing? And it all of a sudden wasn't a angry, visceral response. It was, well, yeah, yeah show us show us what's, what this really does. And from our previous meetings, uh, Jeff and Simon have pointed out to us a couple other times when uh, you've been able to get together with state legislators who've been antagonistic to some of the city's uh, actions and educate them on it. And all of a sudden they found out, wait a minute, you were actually doing things the way it should be handled. They just didn't have the full story. We're here to help facilitate those conversations, use our relationships to bring people together, talk about it, and actually exchange information to get a comfort level going. Excellent. And I think the local legislators, you know, we've talked with several of them. They can help us too. You know, like if, if Vicki Linsing picks something up uh, on the inside and says, you know, so-and-so has a, a major problem, um, we're, we're going to use our, our local folks uh, to help us get to those people. I mean, they, they, they know us and how we work, and we're going to use them to kind of bird dog the, uh, those, those problems <laughs> and let us know what's going on. And we'll get to those people, and we'll, we'll try to chat with them. Excellent. Susan, would you? No, just appreciate that because I've heard some very positive things about your firm and talking to legislators and people around the state. So I'm very happy to have you on board, and, and it makes me feel comfortable knowing that there will be somebody there with their feet on the ground and watching for things so that we don't have some of the surprises that we had last year. And I just want to add one thing. You'd listed off some things. We have so many city employees that uh, rely on the IPER system, so I would hope that that would be one thing. You'd also keep your ear to the ground. I know some of them are saying they're not going to touch it, but from all the surprises last year, I hope that's not another thing that you'll kind of keep an ear to the ground on. We actually talked to an IPERS board member on the way down. Oh, good. good. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, we're keenly aware of your concern on that as well. And we, we know several of the people on the IPERS board, and of course the legislature kind of goes both ways. You've got the board and the legislature, but uh, we'll good. follow that closely as well. Good. Do you see any movement on any efforts for decriminalization of marijuana, in particular giving municipalities home rule authority to issue municipal infractions? I mean, this is a personal liberty issue, a personal freedom issue, as well as a public safety issue, so we can free up law enforcement to not focus on those sorts of crimes. There was some surprising movement last legislative session on a marijuana-related issue, and I believe it was related to medicinal marijuana. Right. Do you see any movement in that area on this topic, and uh, if so, so uh, what sort of movement would you potentially see? Well, anything that potentially 
reduces the, the cost of government, which decriminalization could do, might have a chance. And they did the cannabis bill last year, and we're very familiar with what happened on that. Um, uh, we didn't. We weren't. Uh, we weren't representing a client, but we'd been talked to a couple of times about doing something in that area. So we followed the issue. Uh, that probably uh, makes it a little bit easier to to get into that kind of discussion with legislators. You know, there's this tension between uh, uh, being soft on crime, which you know, is it still? You know, should it even be a crime? Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. Um, I don't, Doug, you got an idea on that? Yeah, I... Thanks, Jim. I'm not sure this is dispositive of the issue, but it's one thing to put into the calculus. Um, it would, you cannot say that it was easy for the legislature to pass the medicinal marijuana bill, either this time or three years ago. Uh, but, but they were open-minded enough and, and understand, understood what had to happen. One of the large hurdles that they had in dealing with that is that it is still illegal federally, even for medicinal uses. So what we would need to overcome is a, is a comfort level with legislators that uh, you're, by stepping it down and making it no longer a state criminal offense, it's still a federal criminal offense. And how are they, how are they feeling in removing away or moving away from, from the federal structure and kicking it down to just a municipal infraction? Again, not saying it's dispositive, but that was a, that was a very um, often cited concern is that we, we really aren't legalizing medicinal marijuana. It's still illegal federally, and how do we right ourselves uh, in order to move forward on that? So that that's going to be a big hurdle to deal with. <coughs> Any other questions? Jeff, is there anything you need to hear from us? Well, um, what staff would recommend is is that we adopt legislative priorities that are um, pretty similar to those of the League of Cities and to the Metro Coalition, and you, you have the copy of those in your packets. If there's anything else you'd like to see in that resolution, um, uh, let us know. We'll look at last year's policies. You know, last year's policies did get into some of the issues that you brought up. For example, the marijuana issue was incorporated into a broader home rule category. So we'll, we'll personalize that a little bit. It's not going to be just a copy and paste. Um, but if you think we're missing something, um, let us know and we'll incorporate that into the resolution. And of course, you know, the night uh, that you're going to vote on it, if you decide there's something else, um, you can defer or we can amend on the floor as well. So I have one thing. So I have one thing, um, and, I, and I guess also a couple of questions. Um, one focuses on the uh, Metro Coalition's, um, you know, legislative agenda. I just saw some issues that I have questions about um, related to Lost. Um, you know, whether or not we're supportive of what the Metro Coalition is proposing. Yeah, um, I was wondering about that as well. So. That's one. The second one would be um, the automatic traffic enforcement cameras. I know that in 2013, we banned the use of traffic cameras here in Iowa City. And I feel like that's somewhat awkward to support something yeah, that we yeah, effectively totally, yeah, wouldn't be in favor yeah. for. Um, and then the, the other one is an addition. It's not necessarily related to the Metro coalitions. And so I would be you know, um, asking council to add. Um, and I'd be interested in your analysis and your thought as whether or not we'd be able to do this as well, uh, addressing racial disparities and disparities in other represented groups related to unemployment, incarceration, income disparities. And so this was um, information that was littered through Facebook as far as um, I have some of the things here. Minnesota being um, currently kind of the number one as far as racial inequality, and it had a list of different indicators. Um, Iowa was number five. Not too long ago, we were in the top two. Um, so what that looks like, I know that, you know, um, I'm not sure exactly what you know, what that looks like. I guess I would say, you know, if you look at the facts, uh, African-American population is at 3.3. Medium household income um, is 28,000 black, 56,000 white. Unemployment rate, didn't have the information time. Home ownership rate is 26.2 black, 73.5 percent white. Incarceration rate um, per 100,000 is 2,349 black to 211 white. And so there are consistent disparities across the board. And the reason why I want to ensure that
sure that we're focusing on it um, from a more comprehensive perspective is, you know, I don't want to just say, you know, we're going to look at the incarceration rate and not necessarily address some of the issues. I think there's other things that need to be addressed from that standpoint. I know that, you know, um, Governor Branson at the time, I don't necessarily know if Governor Reynolds um, has been very interested in continuing this um, discussion, but I know that he was talking about racial profiling legislation in 2016, beginning of the year, looking at data. I know that our officers, Chief Mary Louise in the audience, has had a considerable amount of conversations and work around the data, presenting that type of analysis. So I feel like we're in a good spot, but I feel like we still need to think about what that looks like, not only taking the data, um, but actually using something actionable behind it. And so that would be my addition, so to speak, based on some of the facts and some of the Des Moines Register. I did look at the Des Moines Register for some of this analysis, information that came out from that standpoint. Well, uh, whether you make that, uh, you know, the council makes that an issue, that's up for your debate, but I can tell you this, it's, a, it's an area that we've, I've certainly been in. Uh, I've worked with Wayne Ford, uh, representing Miller, uh, closely on that stuff. Uh, largely through the Iowa State Bar Association and our criminal law section. Uh, so we've been a part of several programs down there. And so we hear you. Uh, it's up to the council to figure out you know, where you prioritize that and what you do with that as a city issue. In, in particular, the um, racial impact statement that, that is, is tagged on to uh, criminal bills and also sentencing reform over the years. So two, two major areas trying to have an impact on that. Uh, Kingsley, to respond to your earlier questions, um, automated traffic enforcement cameras, obviously that's not something that Iowa City is invested in. A number of metro coalition cities are. You know, again, when you're working as, as a coalition, there's 10 of you. You're not going to agree on every particular policy item. I think what we've really come to a, a, a support as a coalition is the right for home rule uh, and the right for a city if they believe that traffic cameras are um, right for their community that they have the ability to put those in uh, and that's really you know if we if I had to talk to somebody about our position on that and we have never registered for a traffic camera bill um, but I would say I think it's a home rule issue, and I think that, that individual cities should have the right to determine uh, if and how to deploy those cameras. Uh, on the lost piece, um, this is another example. There's seven of the metro um, coalition communities that, that really don't have a dog in, in, in the fight on this issue because they have a lost. You're really talking West Des Moines, uh, Des Moines, and, and Iowa City in terms of the Metro Coalition. Um, and, and in the past, um, we have um, had a agreement uh, on legislative solutions that meet the issues that are in the Des Moines metro area and solve some of their issues um, that um, don't impact us here in Johnson County. Last year when this issue came up, um, there was a change in the way the legislation was drafted. We opposed it um, in Des Moines and uh, West Des Moines, uh, I believe West Des Moines supported it as well and the Metro Coalition, metro coalition ultimately stayed neutral on the issue, as did the League of Cities. And so when there's conflicting uh, viewpoints um, in, the, in the Metro Coalition, there's a, a, a general thought that we would um, stay neutral on the issue, unless it's a 9 to 1 situation or an 8 to 2 situation. If, if we may, Mr. Mayor, uh, yep. to, to, to address those, just a, a, some update here. Uh, we do not believe that uh, the City of Des Moines or West Des Moines are going to press to advance the legislation from last year. March 6th, there's a there's there's a vote in Polk County on the local option sales tax, so they've moved past that and have just gone to a to a vote. So it is not their intent to address that. And second, there's currently pending a, a, a ATE automatic traffic enforcement <coughs> camera case uh, headed to the Iowa Supreme Court uh, that could bring some resolution to that uh, outside of the legislative angles. So. Good deal. I think we're going to have a good partnership. Thanks for coming down. You bet. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but at that point, I, I, I'm very conscious of the time, and I'm thinking about Chief Matherly sitting out here. Uh, my sense is that we should turn to Chief next instead of sure. doing the strategic plan. Thanks a lot. I don't mean to cut you off, but you know, just thinking about time. Uh, you aren't cutting us off. We're just going to go back to the one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing you.
Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, good evening, everybody. Crime, let's talk about this. Uh, <clears throat> your request to have me come talk about crime trends and our response is, is timely. Uh, normally, I don't like to kick uh, statistics out until the year's done. So we have apples and apples to compare it with previous years, but we're pretty close to the end of the year now. It's uh, it's timely for a number of reasons. We've had some uh, <clears throat> very highly publicized cases this year. It's no secret that we've had four homicides and uh, although we have made arrests in all four homicides, uh, <clears throat> it got everybody's attention. And then also where these things were happening at, they were, these were very public type crimes that were occurring. There's guns involved. Um, <clears throat> phone calls started coming in recently to you folks and certainly to to us uh, about burglaries and and you know the general safety of our community and and number one you know is crime running rampant where do we stand today and are we safe and are we feeling safe so the conversation is timely and uh, again so I'm glad you invited me to uh, to talk about it <clears throat> I'm going to go through some a number of slides we're going to talk about the crimes reported. Uh, look at some annual comparisons because it kind of tells us where the trends are uh, and then Iowa comparisons as well as um, uh, the Iowa City PD response. Can you dim that a little bit? Okay, thank you. Um, and we'll let you know what, what we're doing. Feel free to interrupt me and ask questions as we go along. So uh, with that, um, these are the kind of headlines that, that you're seeing day to day in the papers. Um, and uh, you'll see that there's a number of things that, that stick out. Uh, shootings uh, we don't feel safe anymore and this is statewide this isn't just Iowa City it's Sioux City and Davenport and, and Des Moines and and uh, all across the council bluffs all across the state uh, so when you see those kind of headlines uh, for us it's it's unfortunately not just us it is a not just a statewide problem but it's a nationwide problem uh, you know, as you look at us locally here, the, this was our headlines here uh, from the Gazette not too long ago, uh, talking about the fact that these number of crimes and, and types of crimes have put us to the test. And I say us, not just as a police department, but as a community. Um, <clears throat> the upside is we were able to solve many of these crimes. The downside is they, they occurred. And then the question is, what do we do about those? So let's talk about uh, some of the crimes that are going on and put things in perspective. Let's address the facts. And, and look at the stats, and then we'll, again, we'll uh, discuss what we're doing about it. So starting from the very basics of measuring crime, it's easy for me to say, well, crime's down, arrests are up, and that's pretty simple. Uh, but what is it that we're looking at when we're addressing crime stats so everybody has a full understanding of, of uh, what the safety factors are? So we enter our crimes. When our officers go on a call, uh, they look to see if a crime was committed. And if a crime has occurred, the elements of crime have, has, has occurred, then they do an incident report. And those reports are entered into our RMS, our records management system. And then we have clerks that compile that throughout the year, and we report that to what's called NIBRS, the National Incident-Based Reporting System. And NIBRS uh, collects data from state, uh, local, state, uh, county, and, and, and federal agencies. So they're kind of the clearinghouse for keeping crime stats. Uh, so you'll see there under uh, the Group A is what they collect. And group A is almost all crimes, theft, murders, robberies, burglaries, um, 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 embezzlements, uh, sexual assaults. What NIBRS does not collect are the really low-level stuff and I, uh, the simple misdemeanor stuff, uh, disorderlies and, and OWIs and curfews. We keep track of that in, for Iowa City PD, so we have those stats, and you'll see that in our annual report. But NIBRS is, is really the crimes that, that nationally people are concerned with, breaking into houses, stealing my stuff, and, and hurting me. Uh, so they collect the more serious stuff. So with that being said, if you go at any time, you guys can do this in our annual report um, and you look at uh, page 16, we, we have the group A crimes listed and uh, we also do comparisons for the last five years. And so in any given year, you'll see that crime kind of has a wave up and down. Uh, what we hope is eventually that wave gets shorter and shorter and shorter and crime gets less and, and, and we reduce crime. Um, for us, if you look at those totals at the bottom, you'll see that we hover right around 4,500 crimes uh, per year. Some years it's 4,400, some years it's 4,700, um, but it averages about 4,500 Group A crimes per year. And you're looking at 2012 through 2016. Again, this is right out of our annual report for 2016. 
So is everybody with me so far? Okay. And sorry, that print's kind of small there. But So let's look and see what's happened this year. So I've added a, a, a year-to-date column, and you'll see that this is um, 2017. So now I've got 12 through 17. And this is as of December 12th when we gathered these stats. We're sitting at 4,300 Group A crimes. Uh, it looks to me like we are on track to be pretty much even with where we were last year with Group A crimes. So... Cutting out all the, the, the disorderly conducts and, you know, the low-level stuff, when we're talking about crime, from murders to, to everything else, uh, we're on pace with what we were last year and really on pace for what we were about the last five years. So we don't have a, a huge spike in general Group A crimes right now. We're, we're still on pace um, with, with previous years. So that addresses the overall so let's kind of dissect this a little bit because these are what, have what raised concerns initially, especially with the homicide. So I just selected uh, uh, four of the crimes against persons categories, and you can see that first one is uh, weapons. So that's, you know, for 2012, we had 25 weapons violations, and that moves right across. And you'll see that in 2017, we've had an increase in weapons uh, violations. Uh, that means crimes that have occurred involving guns, knives, uh, things of that nature. Uh, I will tell you that uh, seeing an increase in, in weapons is concerning. Uh, I will also tell you that we've had an increase in weapons being stolen. Uh, I can't tell you how many calls we're getting where people say, my car was broken into. I don't know why people leave this stuff in there, but they took my purse or credit cards, my iPad, and my gun. Don't leave that stuff in your cars. We, we continually try to remind folks, don't, don't make yourself a victim. And let's get these weapons off the streets by not making them accessible to be stolen. So that has been a concern. And we're seeing a spike in those weapons. Uh, in talking to other chiefs statewide, they're seeing an increase in weapons offenses as well. So just like the headlines I just showed you, we're not alone in this um, for whatever reason. We'll talk about that. Uh, the aggravated assaults, you can see that those have actually, and aggravated assaults are, are beyond a simple assault. It's where there's more serious injury involved. Uh, we've had 86 so far this year. Uh, that's a downward trend, so we're hoping that that stays low. Robberies are up slightly to 53. It's certainly not an all-time high. In 2013, you had 62 robberies. Um, concerning, um, I think when I first got here, I was watching the trends, and, and I could almost pick the areas where these robberies were starting to happen. Um, and so we got a little bit better that are at directed patrols. We've made some arrests in that area, um, but certainly robberies are concerning. And then there's the homicides. And you can see that every two or three years, we have one homicide. Uh, in this particular case, we had four. I won't talk about the cases specifically. We know we arrested one individual for committing two of those robberies. So um, those speak for themselves, those incidents. And again, uh, I'll give credit to our staff. They worked very hard from, from our, our records clerks to our patrol officers to our detectives. Um, and clearing those up. So kudos to them for, for making that happen. Chief, on the weapons, does that include the theft of weapons, or does it just include the use of weapons in a, in a crime? Good question. No, not thefts, weapons offenses. So uh, guns involved or, or, or knives involved in the crime. Right. Okay, thank you. So. So let's look at some comparisons. These were gathered by the uh, Dubuque PD, the, the Chief Dalsing over there, in a presentation he was giving uh, out of concern for crime in his area. But he uh, asked us to supply um, statistics on the confirmed number of shots fired calls that we've gone on, and then along with our murders. And you can see where we're sitting there. We had 20 shots fired in 2016. We've had 20 so far in 2017. Uh, and then no homicides last year and four this year. And there's the rest of the stats. Uh, Davenport, though, those 12 homicides you see for 2017 are all firearms-related homicides. Um, so again, um, a town with with uh, 30 or 40,000 more people than us, but they're just uh, really been hammered with these homicides. Um, Des Moines is at 25 homicides this year, to give you a correlation there. So um, they're they're up everywhere. Um, do I expect this to be a trend for us? I, I don't. I think four was an anomaly. Uh, it, as concerning as it is, I, I can't predict when you know a son's going to assault his father and kill him. Um, unfortunately, those things do happen. But for us, uh, this this isn't the norm, and it is concerning. But I, I think uh, I think it's something that that's not going to be a trend for us. Um, but we have to stay on top of things too. Chief, it'd be good to see those translated into per capita data. Sure. You know, 
Cedar Rapids is it's, it's a lot more people than we do. So right, absolutely. And and anytime we do these comparisons, you're right. And and it's geographic location too. You know, we sit right on I-80, so we've got what 30,000 cars a day going by our doorstep versus uh, another eight place like Sioux City that that's far north. So uh, I agree. Um, so these are stats that that the FBI keeps track of and. Uh, um, the, the most recent, we don't have 2017s, but I wanted to kind of show you how we compare with other cities in Iowa. So these are the latest from the FBI 2016. And what I did is I sorted them by violent crime. So even though we're the fifth largest city uh, in Iowa, we sit at number seven for, for violent crimes. And that's simply that 197 is adding up murder, rape, robberies, and aggravated assaults. So all the, those that you see listed, the 197 is a total of all those crimes. <laughs> Um, and then if you look at our property crimes, which is the burglary, larceny, which is theft, uh, motor vehicle, and arson, and again, this is what the FBI tracks, we sit number eight. Uh, although we're fifth in, in uh, population, we sit number eight in those. Um, so, you know, are we a safe city? According to this, and according to our population, according to our numbers, we're a relatively safe city. Um, if we were number five in population, sitting number one, two, or three, it'd be more concerning. Uh, we're pretty consistent through the years with these numbers, uh, and so that's where we're sitting uh, compared to the other Iowa cities. So then shifting off persons crimes, let's go to property crimes. So we looked at burglary, uh, thefts of motor vehicle and vandalisms. I was able to add 2017s to this. So uh, looking at those numbers for burglary, it's the, the uh, blue, purple, whatever color that is. Uh, we're sitting at 335 so far this year. You can see the all time high was 420 back in 2012. Um, we recently saw a spike in burglaries and I think that's when some of your phones begin ringing. Certainly uh, Pauline had approached me and, and Rockney and, and uh, we, when your phones were ringing, ours were ringing as well. We started to see a trend for daytime burglaries occurring. Uh, I will tell you that we've made some recent arrests. We've recovered some property, stolen property uh, since those folks who were put in jail, those have stopped. So we're, we were certain we knew who was doing it. We were able to catch most of those folks, and, and I'm confident that, that that little problem has been resolved, at least for the time being. Uh, thefts from motor vehicles, uh, you can see there's a spike in those as well. Uh, I will tell you that when you're dealing with a number like 300, I can unleash a, a, a couple of people with bad intentions into a neighborhood for a weekend and they can <laughs> break into 40 cars and that throws that stat right out, uh, you know, the curve off. So uh, it's a very, when you're dealing with low numbers like this, uh, going from 200 to 323, a couple of people could raise havoc in a, in a weekend and, and raise that number. And then vandalism. The criminal mischief, uh, we're at 494, uh, which is fairly low, so considering previous years. So that's where that sits. So when we talk about, well, this neighborhood seems to be getting hit worse and this neighborhood is getting hit worse with crimes, I, I took... Uh, the last uh, October, November, and mapped the uh, residential burglaries, which is the purple, uh, business commercial burglaries, which is the yellow, and, and then uh, thefts from motor vehicles is the blue. And you can see that it's it's not a neighborhood problem; it's a citywide problem. Um, uh, we were getting hit with these burglaries and, and these thefts from motor vehicles, uh, and these aren't stolen vehicles. Let me be clear: it's it's breaking into a motor vehicle um, all throughout the city. So, and I also invite you and remind the community that um, we have crime mapping in the, on the icgov.org on the police website. Um, so you can always tap into that and see where crimes are happening. And it goes back as far as six months. It's a LexisNexis page. So it's a free service and you can see where crimes are going on. Um, so always feel free to, to tap into that if you're wondering. So going down into the neighborhoods, I, what I did here is I took the top five neighborhoods for call volume, the five neighborhoods that keep us the busiest. And, you know, one of them is 1,500. The downtown area is about 17,000 uh, just because it's a busy area. And you can also see, according to the map there, that it goes all the way up towards Hancher. So the downtown district that we measure is much larger than just what, what we would, what Nancy would think of as a downtown district. Um, it's a much wider area. It includes some of the neighborhoods as well. Um, 
But looking at those numbers, uh, the burglaries uh, are down in the downtown district area. Um, the uh, the thefts remain about the same, and you can see disturbance calls. Now those aren't crimes; those are just actually calls for service. That's the CFS disturbance calls for service uh, remains about the same. There is a downward trend in general uh, from those, which is a good thing, and I think that's come with better monitoring of, of alcohol and and uh, the under 21 law and, and things of that nature that have cut down on some of those those downtown issues. Then the next neighborhood uh, of the top five is College Green. Um, the mapping is there for that. Um, and obviously, it's just off in, into the east of this area. Uh, but again, I think those, those stats speak for themselves. Uh, there's nothing breathtaking about those uh, as far as a spike. As a matter of fact, you'll see the disturbances are even down as well. Burglaries are, are certainly down a little bit, uh, and the thefts remain about the same. And then the Grantwood neighborhood, and, and again, to hit the headlines, we just had a, a shots fired outside of the school. We were on, just to let you know, we were down in that area and had targeted patrols there because of the daytime burglaries. Uh, we had an, a car on that scene within 45 seconds of the, fall, of the call, so we were right on top of that call. And as you recall, we made several arrests as a result of that. Um, so... Uh, those numbers look good. The disturbances are definitely going down. Um, burglaries up, and, and we, we know that it spiked a little bit. That's why we were down there, and we certainly, I think, uh, have resolved that issue with the arrests. Uh, and then the thefts also remain about equal. So as you're seeing these trends here, you're not seeing anything really breathtaking. A lot of it seemed like it was out of control, but it's, it's not a whole lot different than, than past years. Uh, this is the southeast neighborhood, which is up towards Mercer Park, um, just north of Grantwood there. And again, uh, the numbers are, are pretty even across the, the board there. And then Weatherby. Um, and uh, you can see the disturbances uh, really peaked a high in 2014. We've since uh, brought those back down. Um, some of these burglaries, we're at 28 now so far this year for 2017, and, and again, those are part of those daytime burglaries, and the thefts remain equal. Um, we've got a good group of people down in the, in the Weatherby neighborhood that are working um, very hard to make that a, a solid neighborhood. We've got good communication down there, um, and I'm expecting good things in the future for that neighborhood, as well as all of them. But So... What are we doing about the crime that is happening? Uh, the biggest piece that's important is education. We have a community outreach program, as you know, uh, staffed by Officer Hayes and Cash and, and Henry Harper, and um, you know we, we hope to add to that soon. Uh, it's a very important piece. Uh, they are getting the word out. They are building relationships, as are all the officers, um, to educate the public on, number one, don't be afraid to call us. Uh, and work with us, but also, um, you know, do the best you can to prevent crime. Like I said, don't leave those valuables in the car, better lighting. And, you know, we, we, we put that message out all the time to remind people, don't be an easy target, don't be a victim. And that helps. The other thing we're starting to do is focus deterrence. I will tell you when I came here, um, we really didn't have a plan for addressing crime. Uh, the, the days of, we'll just go out and hit a particular neighborhood and move everything to stops is, is not acceptable, and it's not effective. So focused deterrence, uh, what we do there is increase our interaction, communication with, with known criminals. Uh, we know who these folks are. The neighbors know who these folks are. So once we identify them, um, to, to pick up the pace on contact and with them and uh, communicating with them, letting them know that what they're doing is not acceptable um, and uh, identifying who they're hanging out with, what are they driving, and deal with those folks that we know are committing crimes. Um, it's effective, uh, it's appropriate, uh, and it works. Uh, I will tell you, we, we kicked it into high gear with that right after the Penn Mall shooting. So. <clears throat> Social networking analysis is not social media. It's it's exactly that. It's it's determining you know who who the players are and and who they're hanging out with, and and get that diagram going so we know who we're dealing with, and and policing intelligently and not just haphazardly. 
um, and getting the entire department involved. This isn't just a investigations tool. It's not just a, a, a patrol tool. This is everybody needs to be involved in this. Um, so uh, we're updating our strategic plan now, our, the, the, the police st strategic plan, and we're going to include a crime reduction um, objectives in there. So we're crystal clear on what direction we're going. I will tell you our plan hasn't been touched since 2007, so it was due, and we're working on that. One of the biggest things, too, is uh, developing a criminal intelligence system. Again, on my arrival here, we did not have one, uh, and that's not the way we should operate. So we've already put one in place. It's at the officer's fingertips in their patrol cars now, so they know uh, what's going on, and they don't have to try to go by memory or anything else. So it's very important that we, that we maintain that. Uh, directed patrols, we talked about that. And then assigning additional staff to investigations. We um, <clears throat> put one additional officer in there, in there right after the Ped Mall shooting, um, along with the directed patrols. And I think you saw the increase in the Ped Mall area right after that. And uh, we've certainly made a lot of headway by beefing that up and, and being more robust in that area. So recent developments, I mentioned some of these. Uh, the uh, arrest for the murders, weapons, charges, burglaries, and robberies. Uh, we're doing very well. We have a clearance rate right now of <clears throat> about 38%. Uh, nationally, that hovers the clearance rate. That is, the ability to clear crimes is much lower than that. So we're doing fairly well with our, with our clearance rate. Uh, I will tell you, we weren't measuring that when I got here. We are measuring that now, and we will continue to measure that. And we've recovered stolen property. We just recently served some search warrants uh, for these burglaries and recovered some property. Um, but everybody needs to know, and I think you probably already do, that you know most of these crimes are committed uh, by the same individuals. These are usually groups that, that get out and they raise havoc. And, and if they're successful in burglary, they do additional ones to you know keep reaping the benefits till they're caught. Um, so we're working very hard to, to arrest them when this does happen. And then one of the other things we're, we're looking to do is uh, we are requesting two additional police positions in the in the 19 budget. Um, the staffing would be put appropriately, not just put in patrol, but in appropriate places to really make a dent on crime and to really be effective in our community policing efforts. What aren't we doing? And I think this is just as important. Uh, we're, we're not sending officers out and stopping everything that moves. Like I said, it's, uh, it's ineffective policing, it's a waste of manpower, and it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Uh, we're not doing the pretextual stops as a primary investigation tool, and that's been kind of in the media here recently about pretext stops. Pretext stops are where you stop somebody for a minor violation, but the intent of the stop is to dig further into the car. Uh, I will tell you, using those techniques erodes trust, and it's certainly not the way that we want to operate. So we're staying away from that. That's it. Questions, comments, concerns? Great report, Chief. I'm very conscious of the time, though, so we don't have a whole, we've got two or three minutes, maybe we could ask questions. So anybody have something burning inside that they want to ask? Uh, what's the status on the use of cameras, for example, in the downtown? Has it been discussed? We're putting some infrastructure in place right now uh, for cameras. Um, we plan to move forward. Jeff can probably talk more about it, uh, but, um, you know, when used appropriately and, and uh, for investigations, I can tell you the footage we were able to get for the Ped Mall shooting was invaluable. Um, and if you saw our response to that, we had afterwards to beef it up down there. We put police cars strategically with the cameras running just because we didn't have regular cameras to have on. So it's important. Um, Jeff, yeah, you the budget that will come to you probably Thursday of this week electronically <clears throat> and that you'll discuss in January includes funds to begin uh, an expansion of our, our current camera system that we use for our buildings and our parking facilities and extending that out into the downtown area. When we did the Washington Street project, um, the light poles that were installed, um, have we made sure fiber was ran to them, that there's the capacity to, to hold those types of cameras. We're doing the same with the Ped Mall. Um, these aren't cameras that we would do any live monitoring of or anything like that. This is really an investigative tool and hopefully a uh, a crime deterrent as well uh, for that downtown area. But 
as we look back at the last few years and, and some of the high profile crimes and incidents that we've had there, and I look at the hours and hours that the investigators have had to uh, pour into those cases, um, and if I could if I could know that I could save several hundred hours of, of officer time by simply having those cameras there, I think it's a wise investment. I think it's the time to start that process. So, um, the the I've talked with the chief about that and our and our IT folks who manage our camera system now, and uh, uh, we believe that we can start to build out that system. Uh, probably starting in the spring or summer of next year. Uh, but that's a that's a point of discussion uh, that you all need to have. It's certainly some policy decisions that need to come with that. And uh, we hope to kick that off with the budget proposal in January. I have two quick things in 30 seconds. So one's a statement and one's a question. The first statement, I just want to say I'm proud of our department. I think that you um, kind of talked about it twice, um, but again, moving away from a perceived policy around, um, you know, going to neighborhoods and stopping everything. I'm not saying that that was the policy, but there was a perception um, that that was the policy. And so moving away from that, I think is huge. And I think that, you know, my phone in that sense has stopped ringing because that was a huge concern when I was on the ad hoc diversity committee. That was a huge concern when I ran on council the first time. And so I'm happy about that. I want to get that on record. The second part um, that is uh, it's a longer conversation, so I'll follow up with you after, but I want to get it on record is, you know, if you look at the paper, at least I know a lot of these kids. I mean, and maybe we don't see them as kids. Maybe we see them as adults because they're a lot older now. I'm worried about that because I know that there's perception. Or there's a narrative around, you know, these these kids coming from different places. I know that I've seen a lot of these kids in the paper, and I've I've, I've been with them since, you know, I, I got here in law school. Um, and so I, I do think there's a – I'm not saying anything from your standpoint. I'm definitely not saying from a school standpoint, but I feel like there's a mental health standpoint or a piece – that's missing from this um, because, you know, these kids just don't up and commit crimes for no reason. So, uh, instead of addressing the symptom, because I think we're all, we are looking at the data and the symptom of the issues and you're addressing those, we have to look at the problem. So I just want to get that on record and I'll talk to you afterwards. Well, I appreciate that. And, and remember, we're doing the CIT stuff for a reason. If we can start identifying issues and not put these folks in jail, even if they are doing, a, a, you know, a theft or a burglary, a lot of times it's driven by their other factors. We need to identify that and stop it at the beginning uh, and, and get them into the right resources. So I agree. I just want to comment real quickly. You mentioned a number of things, and I, I didn't write them down as you were going through, of things that you're doing now that were not in place when you started about 11, 12 months ago. And just really impressed to see those changes and, and kind of improvements and adding some processes and procedures and data collection stuff that, um, you know, really gives us more and more metrics in terms of looking at and seeing what's happening and, and just the way you're directing the officers in terms of the work that they're doing. So just glad you're on board and you. coming on that first year anniversary or maybe we yeah. passed it yeah, it's coming up in january <laughs> okay so, yeah. well, thank it, you very much <clears throat> as you'd mentioned i i had called you because it did hit very close to home to me right sure. next door in fact and then a block away and folks were saying to me oh, i didn't know you lived in a bad neighborhood and that's like it's not a bad neighborhood it's not a bad city and i appreciate all your data collection because i do have some uh data to throw back at them then and and also i want to just comment on the officers that arrived on the scene there were two of them and and they were very professional very helpful and helped to kind of calm the neighbors and and give them some helpful hints on how to avoid any in other incidents so that's good kudos. feedback i appreciate it i will tell you this is the best crew I've ever worked with. So we, we've got a, a very good uh, department. Jeff, Chief, I, I think it'd be terrific if we could have copies of the PowerPoint presentation in our next info packet, probably. Absolutely. I'll send that to Jeff. So, Great. Thank you, Chief. Great report. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's adjourn uh, the uh, work session uh, uh, until after the formal meeting. Okay, we left off at discussing the process for developing the 2018-19 strategic plan, or we were Let's on the verge of getting to it. Yep. We could what? What are you going to say? Well, I didn't. I, I thought we were going to talk about the legislative priorities. Well, I, I well, I thought we had commented enough we on did. what they said to kind of get it into the mix. So I guess my question was then. Yeah. So I proposed an addition, yeah. and I yeah. didn't know if everybody was supportive or not. Oh, good, good point. Uh, can uh, uh, what, give me a three or four word version? Uh, I mean, I remember the gist. Yeah, basically, it's uh, addressing racial disparities and disparities in other represented groups related to employment, unemployment, incarceration, and income disparities. Yeah, we want you, you want us to lobby the state to do that. Correct. Is that correct? 
I, I think it's unlikely the state would act on that, but it's an important topic. What I would say, um, when you're establishing legislative priorities, it's it's important to be as specific as you can. It's usually addressing a, an issue that you, you, you want to see happen or that you fear that will happen. Um, Otherwise, you know, we have, we'll identify four or five priorities in any given session, typically, but we'll end up working on 20, 30, 40 items that come up. And just how we use this at the staff level is, of course, if you have an established priority, we'll work hard to accomplish that. Anything else that comes up, we use the strategic plan guidance to, to tell us where we should be on a particular issue. And if need be, we'll consult with the mayor uh, on where we might need to be on an issue. Certainly what you just articulated, Kingsley, is directly in line with the strategic plan of this body. I don't think it hurts to put it out there in legislative priorities, but you know, in terms of communi communicating our priorities to our delegation and others, um, if it's not specific, it's it's probably not going to get a whole lot of attention. So I was thinking about that. So I can modify it to address address racial um, disparities related to incarceration and arrests. That was already a topic that Governor Brand said has been focused on. It's already a talk that's been talked about the legislature. And the reason why I added the other piece is because it, some of the facts that I shared with you, it's it's really kind of a, a more comprehensive issue that some of the incarceration and arrests affect some of the unemployment, some of the other issues. So I wanted to make sure that we're holistically looking at it. Well, and just a few years ago, if I remember rightly, the Chief Justice of the Iowa Supreme Court directly address this and drew attention to it. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, so uh, that works much yeah. better. I think. I'll yeah. support that. Yeah. Is that good enough? Yeah, that's perfect. Yep. All right. Can we move on then? Is that okay? Move on to the discuss process for the 2018-19 strategic plan. Yeah. So I won't read through the entire memo, but we're um, to summarize. Uh, uh, my recommendation is that we start the process in mid to late January. Uh, we've been working to identify a new facilitator, um, as I mentioned. The uh, director of the University of Iowa uh, Institute of Public Affairs is retiring, and I'm just not convinced that the schedules are going to align to use uh, Mr. Schott uh, like we have in years past. So we do have a good prospect for a facilitator, um, and uh, uh, we probably need a half day to start with, and I'd suggest that we have two facilitated sessions, um, which would be a, a half day to review the current plan, discuss changes, tweaks, modifications, that sort of thing. Um, let the facilitator go back and compile that, present that to the council again in a second shortened session. I've listed two hour session in early February, allow you to work with the facilitator to um, refine what's needed and then from there just let staff take it like we have in the past. Um, certainly it is your process. You should feel comfortable in whatever um, process uh, you need to invent here. Uh, I just laid out that uh, recommendation and, and we'll work um, based on your discussion tonight. I think part of the thinking that Jeff and I worked our way through was the expectation that the, the general parameters of our strategic plan are unlikely to change, meaning the, the seven main priorities. Uh, and, the, and the overall objective, uh, but that there are specific items that individual council members will want to present to us, and then we'll have to have a process for figuring out whether there are four of us really who want to support the inclusion of those, and then maybe a process as well for um, condensing or, or, or combining s certain uh, proposals so that we can have in the end, a more manageable number that would be helpful for the staff and, and yet be doing what uh, our council wants the staff to do. So that, that's the basic idea. Uh, we didn't feel like we need to have a, a, a really huge elaborate kind of thing. I would agree. I, I think this is a great place to start. And quite frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if the first session doesn't take us a half day. But to set that aside, I think makes sense. And to go through stuff. Yeah, so I'd be supportive. I, I guess to that extent, Jim, because I'm glad you kind of said that. The question that comes to mind is then do we need a facilitator? I think so. Okay, okay, that was just, I just, yeah. no, that was my first question. My second is, um, 
so you know January is kind of a rough schedule for me just when coming back to school and so if there's any way to kind of get that half day on the books at the schedule if not just for like January 6 as soon as possible that could just help me out yeah we can work with Kelly to put some dates out um, any preference you want to give do you, would you rather do an evening session weekend session daytime Terry's going to recuse himself from yeah. this discussion. Any day works for me. <laughs> that was actually one of my questions because I know that previous strategic planning processes, we did our processes, whatever you want to say, we did have prior council members participate in. And so, you know, I know Terry, I would like for Terry to be a part of it, but I just wanted to make sure, that are we, would we continue in that effort even though it's not a substantial change? Yeah, well, they're, they're public meetings. Anybody can participate. If Jerry hmm. wanted to come by and, and participate, he could. Um, I come to the budget session. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's a useful precedent, and I, I think we should uh, just formally invite Terry to be a participant, and then Terry can judge whether There's or not. There's some always good input that, you know, former, if you've been on the council before, I think, and with new people coming, at least one new person coming on, it, sure. it doesn't hurt to hear perspectives. So. Certainly played a part in in the original planning of, of those uh, strategic plans that you said we're going to continue with. So you would be a major part of that. Okay. So are we good with what Jeff has uh, presented yeah. to us? It, to Jeff's last question, I'm good doing doing it during the day, during the week. Yeah, so am I. But yeah. I don't know how that works for everybody. I mean, Kingsley may be the toughest one. It's just the in general, I am too. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the getting it on. Getting the on the schedule. Okay. Yeah. We'll work on that. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, so we can move on to, I'm, I'm going to say clarification of agenda items because there are two questions I wanted to ask. But, so, okay, move on to that. On item 2F4, which is correspondence, there's a request from Michael Marchione to have some council members participate in the UI Dance Marathon this coming February 2 and 3. And I thought maybe somebody on this council Kingsley's is a, a good dancer. dancer, would really like to <laughs> be involved in something like that. But I don't know who. I don't know, Rockney or? Terry. Yeah, I'm gone. <laughs> no, actually, I just hadn't responded yet, but I, I planned on participating. Yeah, great. It's a great project. I Go saw ahead. Rockney dance on yeah. Friday. Uh, I'm not sure if you, you want to. call it that. <laughs> right. uh, Rockney shuffle. <laughs> doesn't sound he was doing a good job, though. Okay. Okay. He, a lot of energy, a lot of energy. He would do well. He would do well. <laughs> Is there any way that I can have this documented? In <laughs> <laughs> I think Roy Sand has some documentation. We'll keep up the video that. for the next yes. one. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, the other thing I wanted to bring up was item 2F8, which is a letter from Julia and Bill Lupod notifying us of their intent to appeal a decision by the Historic Preservation Commission concerning a house they own at 318 North Gilbert Street. And I didn't see a response from staff in the packet, and I assume staff has responded and yeah. all that. Do you recall? Um, we were going to schedule it for this meeting, that appeal, um, but they requested that we hold off until April. And so we said we will. Oh. Okay, so okay. staff did respond, yes. right? Okay, good. That's all I wanted to know. All right, can we turn to inf the info packet discussion? Can I have December have seven? One super quick question about sure. the 2F12 for sure. public comment. Could, could we just get a little more details about that parking issue? Uh, Jeff, if you yeah. know anything about that. I, I don't know anything about that right now. I can okay. say that something prompted the change, whether it was a neighborhood complaint, a, a public safety complaint. Mm -hmm. I'll go back and I can report okay. that to you. I'll wait. Okay, December 7th packet. Like IP2, the Behavioral Health Access Center, and the, oh, the, oh, the white paper we received from the county? Yeah. So there's two points, or three, I guess three points I have, or one point and then two major concerns. So the side of that's moving forward. I think, Susan, you already prompted us of mm -hmm. this, and so it wasn't like super excitement. I was, already was excited. Um, so I'm uh, just excited this county is stepping up in a huge way to facilitate this work. My two major concerns, uh, and you know, I, I talked to Susan about this just briefly, was um, just 
the conversation on the capital cost, um, mainly, you know, looking at the comparative pieces, um, you know, North Liberty and Coralville supporting 10% compared to Iowa City and Johnson County uh, supporting 40%. After talking with Susan, I feel a little bit differently about it because I think you kind of helped me understand kind of the numbers behind it. But it, it's still, I mean, I'll be honest with you, it still makes me feel some type of way, and it's not throwing them under the bus. Just as we think about this is a regional discussion, a regional issue, uh, we need to talk about that. And those are the conversations that I would love to have in like a joint meeting. So I feel like when we talk about or present on other issues, I mean, that to me is interesting, but it's not necessarily something that like I would like to focus on as far as how can we work together um, regionally on like this particular issue and from a funding perspective. The other thing is um, on one of the uh and maybe I'm wrong, Susie may have to help me on this or anybody else that read the document. Based on the analysis, did they mean operating revenue and not income? There was a, a phrase there that just didn't make sense uh, when it was talking about a change. I don't know if anybody has it open. It just it just it, it just didn't make sense from when it was talking about, well, I have to go back to it, just have it in my notes, but basically it said did they mean operating revenue and not income instead? Well, I'm not sure how you're distinguishing revenue and income. I mean, they're, they're both monies coming into the organization. Um, they don't know exactly where all of it's coming from. I mean, they're going to have Medicaid dollars. They're going to have private payer dollars. Um, there probably will be somewhat of a deficit, at least to start out with, and the county will cover that. Um, to, to Kingsley's comment about the percentages, I'll just, when we were talking about the other day, I think they came up with this at least partially from population, and, and I think they're fairly close. I mean, Coralville and North Liberty are something under 20,000, and we're something under 80,000. We're mid to high 70s, so it's we're almost four times, maybe not quite four times the population of each of those. So I kind of think that's what they have done here from the from the previous version, is they have taken out any money from any of the other smaller communities, I think they kind of decided they probably weren't going to get any. Um, so that's kind of where it's at. There are um, meetings are continuing um, on Monday. I, yeah, yesterday they had a meeting of the um, people who would be some of the providers to talk about staffing patterns in a little bit more detail to try and nail down some of the pro forma numbers a little bit better. Um, and I know they're in the middle of... Um, some fairly consequential meetings, I think, at the university level as well in terms of trying to wrap their arms entirely around um, their piece of this. So it continues to move forward. Um, I think the building, uh, you know, the location, whether it's um, built from the ground up or a renovation, that's the big thing right now is trying to trying to figure out that location piece. And so... Um, but yeah, exciting to see it continue moving forward. Jim, I did find the sentence. It says Johnson County will provide funding in the event that operating expenditures exceed operating income up to forty thousand annually. So when I was looking at it, four hundred thousand. Four hundred thousand annually. Yeah. yeah, I was looking. Yeah, at it, I thought that meant operating revenue instead of income. Yeah, I think somebody just stuck in income. I mean, it's, okay, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, they the, the the white paper ends with a request that we make a commitment toward this facility along with the other entities and include funding for the facility in our FY19 budget. Uh, I presume there's money in the FY19 budget. Well, it'll be recommended in your recommended budget that you'll receive later this week. There's funding in there. Yeah. So, so do, do, do you all think we need to have a work session focusing explicitly on this white paper and any other relevant information are we at that stage where we really need to know exactly what we would? I don't be think we're there yet. No, I, th I think when when we start to get a framework of an agreement together, or maybe there's a location that's been determined, um, then it would probably be appropriate. Um, otherwise, I would save it for one of your joint meetings. I think you have a joint meeting in January, and it's probably a uh, timely topic. So I was going to suggest like that. Yeah. 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 I I think there's two really, well, there's three. Uh, if you will, really critical pieces that 
uh, are going to have to come together, and I, I hope they do without a lot of difficulty. Um, I think the first is the 28E agreements between the county and the municipalities on the capital costs and the building, who's actually going to own the building. Um, you know, are we all going to own it jointly as part of that 28E, or is the county going to own it, and yet we're contributing money, and then there's a way for us to get some of our money back if, if this thing shuts down and they sold the building. So that's part of it, is getting those details. And I would assume a lot of that will, you know, between legal counsel for the county and the municipalities kind of working out um, a lot of those details. The second um, and probably the most complicated piece is going to be the contract um, between the county and the university emergency department. Um, laying out exactly what the responsibilities are, um, what the expectations are, what the liabilities are. That's been very clear um, that the county is taking on any um, financial liability, and if it exceeds what they are prepared to pay, then they have said in the white paper they will be coming back to the municipalities to try and find a way to fund um, any of those deficits. But the more I have um, been involved in those meetings and talked with people, there are um, there's just an incredible number of details um, that need to be worked out in terms of, you know, liability issues and, you know, who hires, who fires, are employees that are actually at the nonprofits now continue to be nonprofit employees or do they become, you know, UIED employees? Just, just you know, and I know what I think the answers are and will be to most of those, but I just kind of throw that out to give you an example of um, the kind of detail that has to go into that contract. And so um, I think they are starting with um, an attorney who works for UIHC to begin some of the drafting because that individual gets the medical stuff and the health care stuff in terms of legalities, and um, they'll be working with Janet Linus from the county to try and, you know, massage that. And I'm sure there will be a lot of other people probably involved at various stages um, in some of those details. And then the final really big piece, and, and a lot of conversations have been had already, but again, as we always say, the devil's in the details, that will be the contracts between UIED and the local nonprofits who are expected to be participating in actually providing a lot of the services within the facility. So um, lawyers are going to have a lot of work to do. <laughs> what well, st states here, there are three 2080 agreements we're talking I'm about. I'm not sure they're all going to be 20 AEs. I, okay. don't, I don't think they are. Uh, I think the first one's clearly a 20 AE. I don't, and I'm not exactly sure that we need a facility advisory board necessarily. I, some of those things will shake out as we go along. So. so I want to make an observation with regard to North Liberty's contribution to the capital part of this. Uh, I, I know I have read in some obscure place that they may not be willing to contribute funds for the, their 10%. Their uh, but also last night at the chamber event, I heard that um, a council member who was most strongly opposed to North Liberty participating is no longer on the council. I have no inside knowledge about all this stuff, really, but um, a person who is told me this. <laughs> so it's up in the air, basically, about what North Liberty will or will not do. And that has implications. Well, I, all I can say is I... I I would welcome the opportunity, and I think there's a lot of people that would welcome the opportunity to talk to anybody in the community about this, whether it's people from Iowa City or Coralville or North Liberty or the county in general, um, in terms of the benefit that we see of this facility, that this is a pattern that is now being established nationwide. Um, in terms of these kinds of access centers, um, how much money it can save our emergency rooms, how much money it can save our municipalities and counties in terms of law enforcement time, um, keeping people out of the jails, out of the, out of the legal system. So um, I, I would welcome that opportunity because I, I really think this is an investment that makes so much sense on so many levels. Yeah. Okay, anything else on that particular info packet? That's still 12-7. 12-7. Yeah. 
12, yeah. 7. Yeah, December 7. Um, for IP5, the KXIC schedule. Thank you all for penciling me in. <laughs> I, was no I, hated to mi I hate to miss meetings, but uh, of course was in beautiful New Orleans and uh, had a wonderful convening of the Invest Health group. And uh, they do plan uh, my a team of five plans to come before the council at some point in time uh, and give an update on how things are going. Excellent. But that date works for me. Thank you. Good. Nice article on riverfront crossings. Thanks, Jeff, for putting yeah. that in. Um, IP4, um, and so you already mentioned it, Jim, so I'm not going to mention it again, but adding CIT, I'm supportive of that. Um, I don't necessarily know where we stood on the transportation conversation at the last MPO meeting. I don't know where we're at on that, Jeff, either. I know that there's been talk about a study that was very relevant in some of our conversations over the campaign period. I don't necessarily know that we want to talk about it now or wait till later on. Um, but I, I leave that up to council as well. Just in, uh, I know that Terry Donahue, I think at the end of the meeting, and hopefully everybody remembers it, maybe I'm just misremembering or whatever, mentioned, we mentioned something about a transportation study, and then Terry said we'd be interested in participating as well. And so I, I'm very interested in what that looks like, and I think that's one of, at least for, for me, some of the conversations I've had with Dave Ricketts before he retired was looking at it more regionally instead of focusing on it from a city perspective. Um, the other two pieces um, are affordable housing, but I'm willing to leave that off for now as you talk about it with our strategic planning process. Um, but also, I just want a kind of a general brainstorming session. I think that, you know, there's issues that I think they, that we talk about or bring forth, but I feel like there's, there's not a time where we can kind of talk like what's happening regionally that we can have some conversations about. Maybe crime is something that we want to talk about. I'm just throwing that out there because we just had the present presentation. But I would be interested in more of that type of, instead of presenting what a city's doing, which I'm all for, but I could also see in a packet, I'd be more interested in, you know, what can we actually do to move some of the conversations um, forward from a regional perspective? I mean, each of you have been a part of the League of Women Voters Forum. And to me, it sounds like redundant questions every every council cycle about what are we doing to move the conversation regionally. It's like, well, we meet as a group, and then that's the answer to the question. So, um, I'm not, you know, this isn't a blaming thing. I'm just trying to throw out ideas as far as how we can effectively work together in, in a better way. So those are my three points: CIT, transportation, and some type of brainstorming session. And maybe I mention that at the end, and then we talk about it at the next meeting. Along those lines, Kingsley, I think one of the most enjoyable joint meetings that I had was with the school board involving Horace Mann. That was a, a, a meeting where I felt like we were engaging on a topic of joint concern and offering solutions and actually solving issues, too. It's obviously hard to find the time to do that. I'm aware of that, but I think you bring up a really good point in terms of keeping an eye out for those topic-oriented le levels of collaboration. <clears throat> Any other suggestions about what to include on the joint entities meeting agenda? Can I clarify sure. the, the transportation piece? Um, so, sorry, I was asking a question and also asking you a question. So okay, because there's there's two different ways you may be going. One, the M, at the at the MPO level, there's the discussion on the next iteration of the light rail study, right. um, and I think the MPO board gave some direction and cities are going back and looking at who's funding it, who's not, I don't know, but it's a relatively small amount, I imagine it'll get the funding it needs. The other thing and where I think you're going is is the direction that, that you gave staff to, to put funds in the budget for a transit route analysis. Um, and that will be part of the proposed budget that comes to you. Um, I have had contacts uh, with my counterparts in Coralville and North Liberty to let them know I, this is coming, and if you want to participate, um, let me know. Um, there's been some back and forth on what the scope might be, and I think there's some interest, but I don't know that that's, that I'm sure it probably hasn't gotten up to their council levels yet. Um, so by that time, when you have your joint meeting on January 22nd, you'll have already reviewed the budget. I think if you wanted to put, you know, hey, Iowa City's planning this, we've got resources to do a transit route analysis. If somebody else wants to join us and talk about um, um, expanding the scope of that study to include Coralville Transit or an exploration of North Liberty Transit, whatever it may be, that's that's probably an appropriate topic if you want to go that route. Yes, to that second one. Any objection? Did you track that? Yeah, I'll, I'll work with Kelly on that. All right. 
Any other items? On, I'm sorry, for the joint meeting. Okay, let's move to the December 14 packet. Um, sorry, I don't have the picked. I don't have it up right now. Whatever HCDC recommendations. Six. Um, IP6. IP6. I'm supportive of staff's recommendation to translate the informational disclosure and acknowledgement form um, in the top five languages. So there were two recommendations. That was the first one. That makes sense. Uh, the other one I'm, I'm supportive of as well. I think my, I think you asked the question, Jeff, and I can't remember who wrote the memo right now, but uh, the question was if council wants to look more into it. I, I want to say yes but I want to wait until we have that conversation in the strategic planning process. Because I feel like you know the HCDC's point, or at least I've talked to Charlie somewhat about this, is there's just a, this goes back to kind of the measurable piece of the affordable housing conversation. So I'm not, I don't want to focus on this piece and say yes to this, so I'm supportive of leaving it off. I think collecting the information in the manner in which it was talked about. But I do think it's important to think about that as we move into the strategic planning process. I agree, and there are a couple particular things I'm thinking about with regard to the rent, the rental piece. One is, what can we learn from what other cities are doing? Have other cities tried to collect rent information? Have they been successful at it? Uh, if so, could we replicate what they're doing? And the other is, uh, what I'm, I'm not a, so much interested in, in data about individual rental units and collecting all that data necessarily. What I am interested in is statistically valid descriptive data, uh, meaning things like mean, median, mode, range. I mean, this is kind of standard uh, statistical language about uh, th that kind of descriptive data about rents and uh, generated so that we can track the changes over time, but also tracks, uh, identify spatial patterns. Uh, so if there's some other way of obtaining sufficient amount of rent information, that be, would be very helpful. Like you and I talked about this with regard yeah, to you know, it, that thing that Casey collects, and I don't know if that's... Yeah, I'd have to go back and look. I mean, I agree. I think, I think when we're looking at that affordable housing piece, having more data that really tells us, you know, what, what is happening and if, you know, if rents are going down. I mean, I'm with you, Jim. I'm not interested in seeing what, you know, Joe Blow is charging for rent in unit number four, but in order to get the mean, median, and standard deviation and any other statistics, you have to have, you have to have accurate raw data. And, and one of the points I think that staff made in here also is the challenge, one, is the challenge of collecting it, and so we can talk about that later, but you've got to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. You know, are they including parking in that cost? Are they including utilities? Um, so all those different pieces that you have to ask so you can so you can break it down and making sure that you're actually, you know, comparing apples to apples. So it's, it's a discussion I would like <coughs> to have and try and figure out, and I think you asked the question, you know, are there other communities that are doing this and how are they managing to do it? Mm -hmm. Particularly, are there any in the state of Iowa because does it depend on state law that they're able or not able to do it? Um, I don't know if we'll be able to, but I, I'd be interested in having that conversation to see if there is a way to get data that would help us actually set some metrics in terms of our affordable housing. I wonder if the city's involved in the mayor's innovation project, which we have joined. I wonder if they could provide us with information. Maybe, maybe not. I, yeah, I think and I, I, the collection's not difficult. I mean, you, you typically do some type of survey. You'd hire You'd hire a firm to do some type of survey focused on rent and any other types of um, related issues that you are interested in. Um, and to give you a, a sense of what that might cost, our community survey that we're just wrapping up now is about $20,000. Um, and that was a pretty expanded one. So so maybe, and that'll be statistically valid, and maybe, maybe you can shrink that cost a little bit. That may seem like a lot, um, but I can tell you, if I calculated all the staff time that went into collecting information disclosure forms and, and inputting that data into spreadsheets and analyzing it, it's going to be far more than $20,000 worth of staff time. So 
we can go back and think about, okay, here's how we might collect that data. Um, we understand, I understand where the HCDC is coming from and the need for this. I think we all agree to that. I just don't think this is the, the right approach to collecting yeah. it. So we'll, we'll gather some ideas. We'll have to revisit this when we get to this strategic plan discussion to see if what kind of direction we want to give you. <laughs> All right. The other one, you already, um, is IP7. Yep. Well, I'll let you go ahead. Well, IP7 is about the Sanxe Gilmore House on 109 Market Street. And Jeff has a, a memo in here. It was very helpful. And it's a pretty tricky topic. Um, and uh, maybe I'll want to talk about detail because there's, there's important detail to discuss. I want to jump to the bottom line as, as I see it because I've been involved in a lot of conversations about this now. I think we need, uh, me, we being Jeff, really, we need to initiate a four-party negotiation with four parties sitting down together, focusing their attention on the situation and trying to come up with a mutually satisfactory solution. And I think it's possible, because I've been involved in conversations with John and with some historic preservation people, which have already generated two alternatives that we hadn't thought about before, and I'm aware that you have tossed one out, and you know I don't want to talk about that in public. Uh, so uh, I, th I think if we get these four parties together, I'm assuming you're talking the university, the church, the historic preservation, and then the city. Yeah. And I, and I think that would need a facilitator of some kind. I mean, you know, I think about this stuff in the way I taught it when I was at, at the university, so bear, me, bear with me on that. But I think when you're trying to get people to negotiate, when they're thinking in terms of their own self-interest, but being asked to look at a shared problem and figure out while working with other people how to solve the problem they share together, then you need a facilitator to help make that happen. So there's, oh, go ahead. Uh, and as, has the church and the university expressed a willingness to engage in that process? Um, I, I, well, I, mean, I, mean, you I, think, negotiate, I, I mean, think the university would. Mm. We have not had conversations with the church that I know of, no. so I don't know if they will. I mean, I would support that, obviously, if they're willing to, but that would have to be with their consent because they have a bilateral agreement between the two of them. And, um, so it, it can be changed by yeah, mutual agreement. Yeah, yeah, by mutual agreement, yep. If, if they're willing to engage us, I, I would encourage that. So I'd be supportive as well. I think my, my first question, and I can't remember whether or not you had this in the memo, Jeff, was around, related to timeline. I know that you wanted some type of council input possibly tonight, maybe not, um, or mean specifics as far as maybe not. But ultimately, I guess the, the structure is what I have a question about. I mean, I feel... You know, if you and John have already had some of this conversation and background, I mean, we've had whatever we've you know received in the packet, but you had knowledge of having these conversations. Is this a when you say city? Do you mean the council or do you mean just representatives? I would, from a structure standpoint, I meant representatives. I, I, I mean, I meant staff when I said. Oh, so. okay, okay, never mind. I'd be supportive. So, but there are details that maybe we would need to process here to really be helpful in providing Jeff with feedback as well. So. Well, yeah, there's there's kind of negotiating parameters that you know, it, with this case, you know, the the big question is is the parking lot on the table? Are you willing to give up that parking lot? Um, uh, or I shouldn't say give it up. Are you willing to transfer ownership of it for preservation? And if the answer is yes, is it only for preservation in place? Or are you willing to give it up and have the building, the actual structure, located to that option? That's probably the biggest, if, if we're going to try to negotiate, and our standing to negotiate is questionable, but we can we can try. Could, could we have a separate work session on that? Because I, I'll just say, I'll jump off and say, I'm a huge fan of historic preservation. I love historic preservation, but, that property is worth a million dollars. That seems like a lot of money if we're talking about gifting it away. But I realize you may not be talking about the, the entire park green lot. There may be iterations of that. Um, that strikes me as something very difficult to discuss on the fly. Um, so that would be my preference if we could have a short 15 minute or work session on that in the next month or so. Is, is that within the parameters that we're talking about in terms of time? Um, I just don't want to think extemporaneously or speak extemporaneously on something as important as that. 
Yeah, the, the timing's tricky because technically the, the property transfers in uh, sometime in the summer, and the university's communicated to me that they intend to tear the building down when they take ownership of it, if it's still sitting there. Um, the church is anxious to figure out what's what's going on because this is this isn't just a structure for them this is part of their operations too they have their outreach ministry outreach out, uh, out of this uh, facility so they're anxious to get moving it requires a code change and a code change of this nature um, would probably start an historic preservation commission because it's dealing with the preservation of a building so it would go from historic preservation who, who may need a meeting or two to planning and zoning to city council where you have a minimum of two council meetings so we're going to get to summer real quick on that schedule so we got to we got to keep it on if, if there needs to be a work session that's fine i, I think january 2nd is when that needs to take place i would support that i would too I can do it. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, with regard to the parking lot, uh, I, I, I would not say put it on the table and say, "Yeah, we'll give this for you know, we'll just trade it and give them, you know, give away a million dollars." But I would say it's a, a really important asset that could help us collectively figure out how to solve the problem, That's and and it, it should be part of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I want to be clear about the million dollar number. That is just looking at square footage and comp sales. That's not analyzing development potential. And you've got to ask yourself, wh what would you want to see developed in that in that area? Uh, and, and would it go to that kind of highest and best? So there's just yeah. keep in mind that's where that number is coming from. It's, it's, it's a per square foot analysis based on comp sales. All right, so we decided to do a work session on the second, right? Yeah, it might be helpful. Uh, we don't have much time here, but it might be helpful to have some kind of conversation with Gloria Day uh, people beforehand to really get a clear sense of what their interest are, what their interest is. Okay, moving on, I guess. So I'm a little just confused about where we are on my thing here uh, we're still on um, the info December 14, info packet, 14th December 14th, right yeah. and uh, the um, uh, info packet so I'll say IP8 strategic plan summary it's a really excellent summary very thorough and I hope you noticed it's very up-to-date too yeah. it's like you know some elements were obviously added like five days ago or something yeah. mm -hmm. so uh, well done Ashley thank you IP11, the household hazardous materials update. I understand the, the complexity of staffing issues, but I also hear complaints about always having to make an appointment to drop off sure. uh, hazardous materials. Um, I think it would be nice in looking at that if, even if it was two or three hours one day every single week, you know, and then otherwise by appointment that people could drop stuff off. Um, again, I, I know that's a challenge because you're looking at the staffing out, the landfill and everything, but if, if there was at least one set time um, every week, I think that would be helpful. Okay. And probably a Saturday morning. It's, it's probably yeah, doable. What, what yeah. works for yeah, I think Jen Jordan's memo says they're looking she, at it. they are, are, are yeah. looking at it. Yeah. yeah. So... I, mean, I thought about it a lot. Every time yeah. I think about taking hazardous waste out there, but oh, got to make an appointment. Yeah. Can I quickly go back to IP8? Is that going to be get sent out through the um, communication portal? It can. Okay, just because it helps me when I'm tweeting it out, and I don't want to. Yeah, it helps sure. me when I'm tweeting it out. That's good. Yeah. yeah, we can have the final summary of the last two years. Yeah. Okay. IP13, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. I assume everybody read every word and studied each number I read it twice. on the tables. Yeah, I mean, it's really Fair terribly place. comprehensive. But uh, I trust I, Dennis, and I skipped it. <laughs> <laughs> I trust Dennis, and uh, apparently the auditor found yeah. the problems. <laughs> Federal government. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for Dennis's version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I admit, I skipped it. 
if, okay. if you do have time and you want to go back because the 600 page budget that you're not that you're going to get is okay. not enough yeah. um, w when you look at the CAFR for elected officials I always encourage you to, to flip through the statistical section which yeah. um, is just one piece of it it get out of the kind of financial minutia and gives you um, things like the principal taxpayers um, uh, overlapping tax rates um, high level fund balance um, that sort of thing it, it's it's more than finance it starts to get to the economy a little bit and and the trends um, we repeat a lot of those uh, with our budget presentation but you might uh, you might take a flip through that section Yeah, there's one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, IP9 listening post update. Thank you, Kelly. I, I was thinking we should schedule one for mid-February somewhere, and then I was thinking maybe at Kirkwood. I haven't done one in a while, so Kirkwood I Kirkwood College? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, not on the street. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the school, sorry. Yeah, that's a good idea. So we can figure out later on who would be involved, but uh, maybe you could just kind of work with Kirkwood to try to set up a specific date and time and location in their community room, I suppose. All right, uh, anything else in that IP, in that packet? Okay, how about council updates on, on boards, commissions, et cetera? Had a Jack meeting last Friday. Um, not really a whole lot there. We'll get started on our budget. So no big surprises. It's just we we run a budget at Jack that I think it's like half the size of Scott County's. It's incredible. Our people do a really good job. Mm -hmm. so. A reminder to reappoint somebody to the uh, paratransit. So I, way to make a downer. We were. Jeez. <laughs> you don't want to think about that. Well, I know you can do it when you have your thing. <clears throat> January 2nd morning. Uh, yeah. Nothing, 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 nothing. I'm not going to say anything either. Okay, so I think we're done for the evening. Good. Thanks, like everybody.